Welcome to the Diary of Discovery, the podcast where we delve deep into the human experience of healing and transformation. I'm your host, Jackie Carr, and each week we will sit down with inspiring individuals who have embarked on their own personal journeys of healing and self-discovery. From overcoming trauma to navigating life's challenges, our guests share their raw and honest stories, offering insights, wisdom, and hope to all who tune in. So grab your favorite cup of tea, find a cozy spot, and join us as we uncover the power of resilience, courage, and the pursuit of authenticity. This is The Diary of Discovery. Welcome back to the podcast. I am so excited to have the wonderful Glenn with us today. Um, Do you want to tell everyone where you are in the world? I will. So my name's Glenn Miles. Um, I live in Mumbles, which is a lovely fishing village uh, on the outskirts of Swansea. Um, And I really love living here. And actually, as I'm sitting here, I can see the sea out of my window. So I I really know that that's a huge privilege and I love it. Oh my gosh, that's so incredible. Yes, I love the water too. So being able to see it from your window is beautiful. So as you know, Glenn, we are here to talk about your healing journey and to just shed a light on what you went through and give a voice to especially more men in the space Mm -hmm. to show them that it's okay to share and kind of move through this stuff. So I would love for you to just take us back to the beginning and just like the start of your journey, tell people how you ended up here. Okay. Well, yes. um, I agree with you that uh, men need to be able to express their their story. And um, I've had the privilege of being part of a small group of authors who are writing their autobiography um, and then basically we're a support group as well in a way and so we're we're writing our story and it's been an amazing experience actually it's been fantastic but I'll take you right back to the beginning so it, the beginning started with me um, I was uh, a, a premature baby I survived um, and uh, my uh, I think even then I was a strong baby and I've continued to be strong in spite of difficult uh, challenges all, on the way. Um, one of the my earliest memories was actually in school when I was um, sexually harassed by other children in the same, in a cloakroom. And uh, I honestly can't tell you why that happened, um, but this very strange thing of, you know, when you're bullied, it's just... Uh, it, it feels overwhelming. And when you're small, you don't understand why people are uh, being that way to you. Um, and it was, they literally pulled down my shorts and then all laughed at my penis. Uh, there was nothing particularly, uh, you know, uh, about my penis that was that was laughable at, but they just thought it was a funny thing to do. Um, so that was, wasn't very nice. And I think... Uh, one of the things that uh, children learn in, in these situations is there's kind of learned helplessness. And I would, um, I became quite um, uh, scared and I would uh, ask the teacher if I could leave and I would go and um, sometimes I'd throw up in the toilet. And it was at an age when it wasn't appropriate to um, to to really talk about that stuff. And teachers didn't have any help in supporting children, uh, you know, in those things. And that's pretty tough. Um, And I know now that teachers do have more support and there's much better child safeguarding. But I remember even during um, my uh, secondary school, um, I was also bullied a lot there. And uh, it was tough, you know, it was... I never had, uh, you know, there wasn't a day when I didn't get um, teased or bullied and, uh, and and a couple of the teachers joined in too. So that's never a great thing. Um, you know, really, the people that are supposed to be protecting you actually joining in, that was awful. So, um, and then when I was um, around 13, I was in a Christian conference centre um, and uh, I shared a room with a man and uh, we had a we had a bunk bed and over the weekend he sexually abused me that was wrong 
but it's taken me a long time to realize that it wasn't my fault. I assume that because um, because I hadn't pushed him away, uh, because I was, uh, you know, really fascinated in what I was, uh, what was happening, then it was my fault. And I didn't have the courage to tell anyone about it for at least 10 years. And, um, and then when I did tell my uh, youth pastor in my church, he was very kind, but he didn't really know um, what to do about it. And um, that was quite a challenge. So, um, yeah, that's my start. Not not an easy start. My brother used to tease me when I was at home, you know, when I went home. So it was it was felt like I never had a let up. You know, I was bullied at school and then bullied at home. And when you're little, you always think like, you know, uh, those years just seem endless, you know, whereas, you know, now when you're older, it's like you can't believe that it's nearly Christmas again, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. That is, as you said, it's it's wrong on so many levels. And it is good that there is so much more of a conversation about all of these sorts of topics in the, you know, the age that we live in now and that there's safeguarding and that there's all of these things. But there's also more ways for them to happen now with social media and you know, all of these different um, outlets. So um, I'm really, really glad that you're sharing this and just yeah. having yeah. that ability to just talk about it and say to people, actually, this was wrong. We can talk about this. There is platforms. There are people who understand, like we can actually have these conversations. So thank you for that. That's really amazing. Mm. And as you were kind of going through this process and you started to heal and you started to talk about this and come out the other side, what did you have to sort of embrace about yourself or get to know about yourself in order to actually go on the healing journey? Well, um, yeah, you know, that's a good question. I think I realized that myself, I had a very, um, I, I really loved being with children. And so that um, myth that, uh, you know, if you've been abused, then you're you're bound to become an abuser is was very confusing to me. And I, I actually went on to become a pediatric nurse, a child health nurse. And and that was a wonderful experience. I just loved that. Uh, I had a caring nature. I loved being with people. Uh, even when I was 16, I worked in a Marie Curie home um, for people dying of cancer and um, just was a nursing assistant there. And so just one thing led to another. And then um, I... I, when I did pediatric nursing, it just felt that was it was the right thing. This was me. And then I had an opportunity to go and work in India and um, and Pakistan, Philippines, and eventually Cambodia. And uh, I ended up working a lot with children who were, were exploited. That became mm -hmm. really important to me. I think there is something about when you're um, when you've experienced, some kind of abuse or exploitation yourself you have a you're very drawn to that um the the people that are and i think that there's a connection that you have with people and i think that kind of connection can be very healing actually so even though i may not have had the kind of counseling that i probably should have had i just felt like it was it was redeeming for me to have uh, an experience you know be able to help other children um and maybe that that uh, enabled me to experience some healing myself uh, on the journey. Um, I really, yeah, I, I, it was always an incredible experience. I ended up um, being in, uh, working for different um, NGOs or charities uh, that were working with children. Uh, I was in, uh, a, 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 in a leadership role and um, I worked in refugee camps and, and then went on to be based in Cambodia where I was working to uh, with different charities and NGOs there and then um, then I uh, I actually had a serious head injury so that was another another big uh, experience big thing that happened to me on my journey and we came back to the UK and I just couldn't get my head around what 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 was that all about you know I felt like I was on track to do the things I was supposed to do and then 
suddenly I wasn't and it may didn't seem to make sense. But I had an opportunity, I thought, um, I had an opportunity to do a master's in international maternal child health. And so I did that. And um, and so that really equipped me to do, to continue to do um, the work that I was uh, thought was the right thing to do. I kind of put it, I don't know if you know that um, that expression, but putting a fleece out where you, you know, you put out, you're kind of saying, well, okay, if if this happens, if I get a scholarship for this, then I'm going to go for it. And I did get a scholarship and I d went for it and that was great. And then I went back to Cambodia and uh, I, I was working with an organization called Tear Fund, who I really respect and like very much. And then I just, things just started to open up about opportunities for working with children who were exploited um, no. uh, more and more children that were being trafficked. And I had, I started a PhD program um, and then uh, the that was in childhood studies at Swansea University. And I, I really, um, uh, I was able to do the research when I was working with Tear Fund, uh, the, the, the um, you know, the field work. And that was over a five year period. I did, um, I looked in every province in Cambodia and looked at the, uh, whole experience of children uh, with violence uh, sexual abuse trafficking those issues and then at the end of the time there I came back to Swansea and we um, worked on uh, I worked on finishing up my PhD with the university here and that was important for me and then um, I wasn't sure what the next stage was but it, things opened up again for us to go back to Cambodia which was great and I and so went back as a now as a researcher and the focus was more on research. Um, and that was important, you know, really uh, listening to survivors was a really important thing. And, you know, I know that that's what you're doing here, Jackie, as well. And I think it really is a healing process for people to be able to talk and to, to write. Um, and um, so just listening to people, their stories, a lot of them children, some of them um, uh, young men and boys, of course, because I'm particularly concerned about them and also transgender as well. And we did, uh, we also listened to the stories of perpetrators as well, those who had actually often done the abuse or, or you know, they'd been buying sex or various things. And uh, then at the end of um, that, that was a, an extraordinary um, time. And I really appreciated my time there. Um, and then we came back to the UK. Um, we did that partly because I had um, some illness issues. And I think working in this space for a long time, you know, you have to have a break. You need to take a break. So I took a break um, and we came back. Um, um, I forgot to mention to you that I got, I, when I was working in the refugee camp, I met this really beautiful woman. Her name was Siobhan and we, I really loved her and I was really honest with her. And we, um, one thing I had to tell her about was that I was sexually attracted to men and that was a difficult thing. Um, and we thought we could pray the gay away, but we couldn't. And that was, that was hard. And so, but we, you know, I was really loved her and we were, um, very committed to each other I was um I um I'm sure that I would still be married to her now if I um if I was still um you know if she was still alive but sadly she died um about a year after we came back from Cambodia so that was very tough and very tough on the children as well um the children I've got three daughters and they're they're absolutely gorgeous girls and um the, the, so I had two biological and then one adopted and re I really loved them uh, dear, I really loved them dearly um, and uh, after a year of being back in the UK um, my youngest daughter who was about 16 at the time she said dad there's something I need to tell you about and she told me that she was pregnant so it's you know so I became a single dad of a single mum and so that became a big challenge another thing to get through and um uh but you know of course then she had teddy uh theodore who's an absolutely gorgeous little boy and uh 
we love him dearly. And so that was, again, <laughs> extraordinary healing, really, for all of us, uh, all the family to have that little boy um, in the midst with us. And um, and so that was wonderful. Um, and then after that, I was in a situation where um, there was a very, there was an, uh, there was a nice woman that I uh, built a friendship with and we got on very well. Um, and then she, she asked me the question, where is this going? And I had to say to her, I'm really sorry, but I can't, I can't do this again. Uh, and I explained to her why I couldn't do it. Um, it was hard. You know, I did, I did like, I was very fond of her, but this, I, I just didn't think it was fair on either her or myself for um for me to do that again and i know how hard it was for siobhan so i then it then the the next thing was to decide whether i was really willing to come out as a gay man and i decided that i did want to do that um these steps are hard you know you uh i've been very involved with the christian community and you know some of them are very supportive and others not so much and um but i really i think it's time to, for us to well it's always been time really of course but i i think it's time for us to um to think about what we are doing when um so with regards to safeguarding you know my experience happened 50 years ago but that doesn't mean that it's not still a problem in the church and we hear you know we continue to hear situations where there's youth leaders or pastors who sexually abuse children and that's not acceptable we need to continue to be vigilant and just because we're a church it doesn't mean that there aren't people in it who are unsafe and need um need and children need protecting from uh mm -hmm. and uh but also you know in terms of uh, the way that the church support um, uh, and uh, reach out to the LGBTQ um, family you know, people, it's it it's, uh, amazes me sometimes how little churches really do engage with the LGBT community. They um, continue to uh, uh, ostracize them, and um, often they don't. Um, they won't allow them to take leadership positions. Um, they won't. Uh, they don't want to. To get. They don't want them to get married in the church. Um, and uh, they. The, their justification is a few uh, Bible verses without looking at the overall um, scripture, the overall picture of scripture, which is all about inclusion and and that you know God has love for everybody, and we need to remember that. Um, so I'm still learning how this all works and how to, you know, how to be a gay man. Uh, that's um, and so you know I'm hoping at some stage I'll find a, a nice husband. Uh, I'm 63, uh, maybe I'm too old. I don't know. I don't think so. I think uh, I, I'm just. I know. I think God's got someone for me, but He um, has hasn't revealed that to me yet. <laughs> so um, you know, I fit. So overall. You know, I feel like I've got these two bookends. One is the my experience of sexual abuse, and the other is me coming out as a gay man. And I've, um, but I've lived an extraordinary life and had incredible opportunities overseas um, to reach out to people and I, um, and to be involved in ministry to children, um, work with children in very difficult circumstances around the world. Um, at the moment, I'm working with children, um, a, a, a program in Sri Lanka. Um, I'm working with a, um, a, a, an, a, um, a project that's in Kenya, um, another project in Luton, <laughs> in, in Luton in the UK, um, and uh, another one with Kurdish refugees. Um, there's a lot of programs that I'm involved in, and I really love it. I'm also involved. I've written several books um, for the Christian community on uh, a Christian theological response to trafficking. But um, the um, book that I'm um, that I've just I'm excited to tell share with you about is called "Embracing or Kutching 
that's just, that's the Welsh um, Welsh word for for embracing embracing me, God, and others. And um, it's a book uh, which I feel it, it took me some months to write it, but I feel it gives you a um, a much more in depth um, explanation of my life. Um, it's got in it some reflections from myself and also some resources for people who want to go deeper on different things. So, um, yeah, exciting. Um, yeah, that's incredible. I mean, that's there's so many elements of healing that you've had to go through, so many, um, like, big moments. And in reality, that's life. Like, that is how it works. That it is, is what it's yeah. about. And it's so... Um, it's so interesting when we just kind of lay it out in a timeline of like, these are all the things that happened. And then we get to look back at it and go, wow, like I actually got through all of that. I yeah. survived all of that. Like I'm still here and I'm still doing things. And I think that that's really incredible. Like it's a really um, amazing sense of achievement in living such a full life, going through so many things but coming out the other end and still being so ready for life, still being so ready for what's next. I absolutely love that. Mm. And I guess my, my kind of question off the back of that would be what was like the biggest outlook change as you've gone through? So you said at the beginning that you were, you know, you were quite a scared little boy. Mm. And that's not the person I see in front of me now. So what was the big outlook change? What was the thought process that kind of shifted for you as you went through this journey? Well, for me, my faith has been really important. So th that's, I think, um, knowing that I, knowing that God loves me is the biggest one, honestly. I, I, I did think that somehow, you know, God loved me, but maybe not as much as, other people um mm -hmm. or you know that i wasn't i was that you know my thought process was or the things that i was thinking about was actually somehow wrong and i feel that i'm in uh, when i felt i realized that actually god loves me so much then that re really helped me in the journey and i um and i also i think um you know seek having a community around you of people who love you and um, remind you that you are loved. I think it's really important. I think mm -hmm. sometimes when we're in our low spot, we can get a bit negative and paranoid about other people. We think, oh, they don't really like me or they're only doing, they're only being nice to me because, um, because they feel they have to rather than because they love me. And, um, you know, people aren't perfect. Of course they're not, um, mm -hmm. you know, but, but they, uh, you know, I know that um, there's several people that I know that if I it was in crisis, um, then the, I could go to them and get support I need. Um, I think that's a really that was a really important uh, part for me though was to was to think um, to remember that people, you know, uh, imperfect as they are, they they really did they really did love me, um, rather than feeling that. Well, you know, not really, because that, that I think when you've experienced abuse a, a lot, that you, you it, it becomes, um, you know, I'm a, I'm not okay, but they're okay. I'm not okay. They're okay all the time. That feeling, oh, yeah, I'm not okay, and and it's so very sad actually to still to constantly feel like that. And I, I think it is a thing that pe people with, with abuse have to push through. But I also think that getting out there and serving other people um, is is a really healing healing um, thing, and I'm I feel very honoured that I've, I'm in the position I'm in, and I know that it's been you know it's years of building on building on building on. I I'm just an ordinary person really um, that's just had extraordinary experiences and used them, um, and I think uh, people feel oh I could never do that stuff that you do. It's actually, actually, you probably could if you were in the situation where you needed to, you know, you get the strength to be able to do what you need to do. And um, that's a huge, 
that's a huge privilege to do to be in that position oh absolutely I completely second the idea of community and having those people that you know you can always count on even if it's just a really small group it doesn't have to be loads of people it one or two people that you just know if you're having a bad day you can reach out and say not okay this is not working I need someone to talk to mm -hmm. or you know I just need to say this out loud or I just need to you know express that I'm not okay and I don't need you mm. even to do anything but I just need you to mm. know because it can mm. be really isolating when you mm. constantly feel like you're the only one that's mm. going through something and it can your brain is very good at tricking you into believing that everybody else is good and you're not mm. and that everybody else you know their lives are working and yours isn't and everyone else has all the things that they need and you don't like mm. our brains are very good at making that comparison and mm. tricking us into believing that everyone else has got it good mm. and we don't especially when we're in that negative space so i think mm. having that community and having that ability to lean in and actually get somebody to call you out when you need mm. it, I think is really, really powerful in this, this mm. whole kind of journey of healing. Because people don't have to have gone through the same thing you're going through. Mm. They don't have to completely understand it. I think it's just that willingness to be there and be open and listen that really makes a difference in somebody's healing journey. And I guess when I hear you explain how you have worked with children all of these years and how you've gone into, you know, all of these communities and run these programs, it's almost like you're creating that system that you would have loved to have when you were in that position. And you're making sure that other people have that system in place where there are people that they can talk to and you know, people who understand and can say, actually, you know, I've been through this, I get what you're going mm -hmm. through, um, which is really, it's 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 really an incredible thing to be able to do for people, because as much as it is healing for you in that process, it's also massively beneficial for all of the mm -hmm. children who had mm -hmm. access to those services. So I think that that is um, amazing. Mm -hmm. How, as you were kind of going through and doing that work, and helping you know all of these children in all of these different communities doing your phd putting out research like going through this whole process how did you find it in the sense of was it challenging for you at times to listen to those stories was it healing for you like was it both how did you actually find that process yeah, it it is very challenging. You know, sometimes just hearing a story can be, gosh, that just so sad. Um, I'm sure that you must have had a few uh, people like that on your calls here. But um, I think that we, you know, sometimes I think, you know how when people get to middle age and, they, and then, you know, I think people say, oh, I don't know whether I've really done anything useful in my life. Well, I've never had that. <laughs> so you know i know that i know that i need there are times i need to take a break you know i sometimes you can feel like no no this is too much going on i can't i just can't think um and uh there are other times when i'm just i just really love it you know I, one of the things i love is uh su su supporting phd students and and new people who are wanting to start something themselves so the the, mm -hmm. the the new pioneer you know the new generation of pioneers it's my favorite thing it's just you know getting alongside them and supporting them in what they do and appreciating and you know just affirming them and saying you know keep going you're, you're on the right track you're doing the right thing so and maybe I'm not so much at the coal front as I was before. Um, maybe that's a natural progression, you know, that we uh, maybe if we are still on the coal front, we're, there's, we're doing something wrong. Because in one sense, we it's our responsibility to to let the next generation get on with it, you know. But, um, but you know, sometimes I do, it, I do feel overwhelmed. And it's, yeah, I don't know what to say. It's, I think you you it's important that you um that you take time out and and um and just 
experience um well I'm, if you have a faith then you know drawing strength from your faith and if you have friends drawing strength from them um that's that's really important yeah absolutely it's so it's it's just so wonderful to listen to you talk about this you know the life that you've lived and the the work that you've done i i really appreciate you sharing with us it's it's really lovely um so what would your advice be for somebody who is struggling somebody who and i mean i'm going to say men i'm going to say mm, men specifically mm. because i think you know we we've had so many guests who can talk specifically to women and can go through that kind of process of this is what i've done and what i've gone through and i think that the healing journey for men and women is very different and the experiences that men and women have going through this are very different so if there are men listening and they are struggling what would your advice be to them hmm. I, I really appreciate you recognizing that it is a different journey for men and um you know i think for for many men they feel like they need to push it down and just not talk about it um you know if they feel like um it's not very masculine to 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 be honest or with people or to share your vulnerabilities but actually it shows incredible strength to do that you know you can um it, it's it's not an easy thing to do and a lot of men um they just can't do it they find it so hard but when those that do choose to do it i think they're incredibly strong and i I think we need to honor them for their bravery in doing that. And, you know, there, there's sometimes, you know, with children, we always say to them, what, um, when we're th th talking about um, safeguarding with children, we say, think about five people that you would go to if you, um, you, you know, if you were afraid and you needed help um, or if you experienced any kind of abuse. Um, because it might be that some of those people out of the five might even be the abuser. But if you if you as men think of five guys who you who you might go to if you were struggling, and it may be that you if you're really serious, you might find that there's only one or two who you really feel safe with and you really feel comfortable to talk to. But do it because um, you know that there, there are friends who um who love you and they 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 want to hear you and they what they don't want to is for you to do something desperate that would um that you could you know harm yourself or or harm someone else um they would be mortified to, if they knew that you hadn't come to them after something like that had happened so i i really want to encourage you to do that you know um I think there's more and more recognition now that I, there's one, one in uh, four girls, uh, one in four women are e experienced sexual abuse um, as a child and one in six men, one in six. So it's not as, it's not as uncommon as we'd like to think. Um, mm -hmm. And we know that that's, um, that has a massive effect on you and you, you may be, you may be in a very um, uh, influential position. You may be a manager. You may be a, um, doing all sorts of incredible things. Um, and underneath that little boy inside is saying, I need help. T respond to that little boy and say to him, I'm going to try and get some help for you. And then do it. Find some help. Um, it's so worth it. And you might find that it's transformational for you to get through that process so um yeah i didn't really encourage you to do it um so 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 pull over if you're in the car get your phone out and find someone and talk what uh, arrange to meet one of your mates and then you can take it from there absolutely thank you thank you so much i think that that is it's such good advice just to get started just to reach out to one person and say actually this is you know this is not working I'm not okay and it can be really tough I I absolutely agree I have 
um, spoken to a number of men who've gone through this journey themselves. I've supported some of my clients and my family through this journey. And it can be really, really difficult sometimes to put words to the feelings and the, you know, explain what's going on. But I think one of the biggest things is always that sometimes we don't have to be able to perfectly explain it. Mm. Sometimes it doesn't have to make sense. It's just mm. good to share it with somebody. And mm. even if it's messy, even if it doesn't make complete sense, it's yeah. all part of the process. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. You know, um, I remember a woman, uh, she was actually a, a nun and she was working in in Thailand and she saw a little boy and he was probably about four years old and he would um, he was in playing in the sandpit and she would make a phallus shape and then he would smash it. And and she knew, you know, just from that, she could tell that there was some stuff that had gone on, which was inappropriate. And she was then able to follow it through. And, you know, that was it, it was just somebody having their eyes open and seeing that that made it possible for that little boy to get help. And you may you, you know, just get into a place where you can you can tell someone I was talking with a guy the other day and he said that um, it's only really been in the last couple of years that these that, that things have come back to him that he that happened to him and he hadn't realized quite how serious it was. And mm -hmm. it doesn't always, it, you know, these things can happen by somebody who should be in a position of trust and that it might be a relative, it might be a teacher, it might be a youth leader or a pastor, um, you know, that all of those should have been people that protected you. It wasn't your fault, but now you've got the opportunity to process it. Mm. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I think it's so, yeah, it's such an important message for people to hear and know that, you know, it wasn't your fault. There is space to talk about this and deal with this. And as I always say, when we do the podcast, like if anything comes up for you and you want to reach out to me, um, I'm sure Glenn would feel exactly the same if you wanted to reach out to him. Like there's all of our contact details are below um, and a copy um, of Glenn's book that you can get access to if you want to dive in in a slightly safer way and just start reading about somebody else's experiences. And um, I, I really find that reading about other people's experiences or listening to podcasts like this can help us form the words because somebody will say something and will think, oh, yeah, that's how I feel or you know, that's what was going on for me. And we can sometimes use other people's ideas and words to articulate what we're not able to articulate at the beginning. So I think it's so important for these conversations to be accessible um, and just out in the world so that people have more ability. So the fact that you've written your book is just incredible. I think it's so wonderful that more people can have access to that. Um, and yeah, we're gonna we're gonna share a link below so that people can get access to that and uh, dive into that more, which is really great. So my my final question for you, and this is a question I love to ask all of my guests because, as we know, healing is not a straightforward thing. It's not a A to B or you know dotted line that works in a, in a straight consecutive um, start to finish. So I always ask my guests, like, you've come through so much. It's so incredible. But what's the next level of healing that you're doing? What's mm. the next level of focus for you? Yeah, no, um, uh, you know, I think um, uh, what people want to read, or what people want to see is this complete, you know, this, this upward trajectory where everything, suddenly everything's wonderful. And mm, no, probably not. If you, if you took... Um, uh, if you took an ECG or an EKG, you know, where it goes up and down and, blah, 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 and then up and down and blah, blah, up and down. Blah, blah, and then, you know, that would be a, probably more uh, more representative of what people's lives are really like. And and um, and I think, um, yeah, I, I. I I suppose one thing I need to get better at is um, getting better work life balance. I'm still. Um, you know, I still do t t overwork and do too much, and it, you know, I'm trying to prove myself that I've that I'm enough, and I, uh, without recognizing that I am enough anyway. <laughs> um, and I and also I think um, I know that 
I know very well that you know a uh, um, uh, a relationship uh, that a husband isn't going to fulfill all my needs. I know that. I know that. And I'm not. But I really would like to find someone who I can uh, live with, and uh, that we can be uh, well, ultimately to get married to. Um, and uh, I'm not expecting that to happen overnight, but it would be it would be nice. So if there's any if there's any good looking, um, hunky, um, fit. Uh, wealthy <laughs> men out there who uh, who are looking for a partner, um, anyone between 40 and 70, you know who to apply to. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that so much. Well, hopefully we find you a husband, Glenn. I'm, yeah. I'm very, looking, very much looking forward to this. <laughs> yeah, you can come to the wedding, Jackie. Amazing. <laughs> Oh, I love that so much. I think it's so um, it's so incredible. One of the things that I noticed as I've kind of done more and more of these podcasts is when people go through healing for the first time, everything feels really heavy and really hard and really challenging. And as people go through and I'm going to say master healing and they do it more and more and they get better at it, there, there comes a level of lightness with the challenges that we face there comes a level of like actually I've gotten through so much I know I'm going to be okay even though this is you know something I really want or something that isn't working for me or something that I find challenging or something that's not you know not quite right there's a level of kind of lightness with it and I think that that is it's just so incredible for people to kind of see that yes it's not singular yes it's not linear yes it's not you know a start to finish but actually it does get easier. The process of healing gets easier. The more that you talk, the more that you share, the more that you engage, the more that you write, it does get easier to actually say these things out loud and say, you know, this is where I'm at and this is what isn't working and this is what I need. But that's normally really hard when you first start. So it's really good for people to kind of see that progression and know that it Mm. will get easier in time. Yeah, that's really precious. Yeah. You know, the other day I met, um, I was in, I went to the park and I met this um, couple there and um, this this woman that she said to me, she, I started sharing a little bit about my story and everything. And um, she told me that she'd been working overseas in Sierra Leone and she had, um, and she had prayed that morning that somebody would be in, that she wouldn't be able to meet somebody who, um, had similar understandings and everything and that it was so she was actually in tears when she was talking to me and it was so lovely to be in you know to con- connect with somebody like that and I think I think part of the healing journey is to you know to be open to connect with people to say hello hi um you know so I, I met another guy in the in the supermarket and you know he was buying a Thai meal and I said oh do you like Thai food you know you get into a conversation and and before you know it you've got another you know there's a connection and I think when you when you're in that situation um you know you're looking uh, people really look really appreciate it you know they know that you um that you're interested in them and I, I and I know that's what we want for ourselves isn't it we want people to be interested in us so um, but you know, sometimes we have to do the hard work of actually reaching out to other people as well. Um, so again, I would say relationships are all about. That's really where the healing will happen. And and in my book, I talk about embracing me, God, and others. I think you receive healing for yourself when you reach out to God and to others. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Glenn, it has been an absolute honour to talk to you, an absolute privilege. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, I'm so, yeah, I just, I love having men on the podcast. I think it is so good. And if there are any um, men listening who want to come on and share your stories, we always have applications open through our Instagram page. And below, you'll have access to be able to reach out to myself, to Glenn, and to get access to Glenn's book. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for listening to another inspiring episode of The Diary of Discovery. 
If you found value in today's conversation, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends, family, or anyone else you think might benefit from the stories of hope and transformation. Your feedback means the absolute world to us. So please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. Your reviews help us to reach even more listeners and continue to bring this meaningful content to the world. Until next time, remember, your healing journey is valid. You are never alone and you have the strength to get through this. Keep shining bright and we'll see you in the next episode of The Diary of Discovery.